Good afternoon. It's uh, either great to be first or last, so I feel honored that I'm last today. And what I'd like to do is describe to you a way that we can have our cake and eat it too. Basically, that's what we all want, and that's what we all strive for. So here's the way to go about it, in my view. To begin with, let's discuss what's going to happen. And I don't think this is going to lose momentum just because we say it shouldn't be happening. In another 20 years, 80% uh, of us will live in cities. And this comes with an, an enormous responsibility for our ecological footprint. That is, how much resources do these cities require in order to just stay alive? And those resources come from the surrounding landscape and at great expense to that landscape, as we heard earlier today. So the big challenges that we face in the next 20 to 30 years are safe and abundant water and food, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, and most importantly, restoring damaged portions of the environment that were subjugated to farming, for instance, uh, in uh, substitute for, let's say, a rainforest or a wetland. So if we don't have these two things, it nothing else matters. So let's just talk about these. 70% of the liquid fresh water on our planet is used to grow food. Not to drink, it's used to grow food. And there's a consequence for this, and that is it produces something that we don't ordinarily talk about when we talk about agriculture, and that is the runoff that occurs after the water is used by the plants. It has to go someplace, and where it usually goes is into another body of water, like a river or a lake, and eventually those rivers coalesce into larger rivers and eventually end up in the ocean. And the ocean takes the brunt of all of those chemicals that we've put on the land in order to get those plants to grow for us. One of the worst floods in the United States history occurred in 2011, and all of the detritus from that event ended up in the Gulf of Mexico creating a dead zone that's still there. And in fact, that dead zone's been there since 1993. Another thing that's happening, of course, is that the climate is changing. Now, the climate's always changed ever since this planet first coalesced from debris during the Big Bang era of this uh, universe. So we have nothing to uh, be surprised about except that the rate of climate change is now accelerating. And perhaps something that we're doing is accelerating that. And so we're having difficulties agreeing that that's the problem. Well, it doesn't really matter whether we're the cause of it or not. We're still going to have to do something about it, aren't we? And mostly, what's happened is we've taken away the ability of the Earth to sequester the carbon dioxide in excess of what would ordinarily be there if we hadn't used fossil fuels. So that extra amount of CO2 isn't coming back in the form of trees, it's coming back in the form of an acidified ocean, which is preventing hard-shelled organisms from forming their shells. There's something to be done about this, and there's something to be done that every one of you can be involved with. And that is, if you realize what the problem is, you can begin to address the issues of how do I go about remediating it. And the biggest problem that I see is lack of concern for the environment that we've sort of commandeered for our own means. And e ecological restoration of the environment is critical. If we don't think about doing that at the same time as, as we are thinking about providing food and water for the growing populations around the world, it won't do any good 50 years from now to end up looking around at 10 billion people that have no other place to go because all of the natural resources, the life support system for us, has been disconnected. And we need to be able to restore that. The world population is growing, we know this. It's growing at a rate which is increasing. And it's not necessarily driven by the fact that there's now more resources available, so therefore there could be more of us. There is a lag between the, the shortage of resources and the production of people, apparently. So in another 50 years from now, perhaps there'll be another 3 billion people to feed. And in order to do that, we have to look at what we're doing today. And this is how many people now need the size of South America in order to feed themselves. That's an enormous footprint. But if we have three billion more to feed, we'll need another size of Brazil's worth of land in order to accomplish that. Now, if that's how much land there is, this is how much we are to use. And so there's not enough left. Granted that in the days of old, agriculture has been very good to us. 
10,000 years ago when agriculture first arose, there might have been a million people on the planet. And today, look at us. So just in 10,000 short years of history, we have invented ourselves to the point now where agriculture requires all of these resources in order to be carried out. And it produces food, but it also produces this unwanted consequence, namely agricultural runoff. Cities themselves occupy very little amounts of land, only two to three percent of the terrestrial environment, but they generate over 70 percent of the CO2 emissions. Those CO2 emissions come because all of the things that are brought to the city makes the city happen, including fossil fuels and food, of course. So cities can be compared to black boxes in some ways. The resources come in, we're aware of what they are, we do something with them, and then somehow the wastes get taken care of, or do they? Today's cities are non-sustainable at the current rate of growth and at the current rate of providing municipal services for these people who were migrating in from the countryside into the city. In fact, if you look back in history, these cities weren't sustainable either, and probably for the same reasons. Overcrowding, success, need more success, imperialistic behavior, failure. Uh, there's a book by uh, Jared Diamond called Collapse that doc documents a lot of this, and it's a good read, actually. So my question to all of you and to everybody else on this planet is, can we do this and at the same time do this? Because if we can't do the second thing, it's, it doesn't pay to do the first thing. We, we might as well just all get on that spaceship and go to Mars. So we can do anything we want, including going to Mars, and including going to another galaxy if that's what we choose to do. We are extremely clever and uh, inventive and creative. You just have to tell me what you want first. So what I want is to provide enough food for 10 billion people and have a, an Earth that behaves sustainably. So I know that we can do this because we have the technology now available to us. We can create food supplies off the land that are even more efficient at producing food, healthier food, safer food, food sovereignty issues are addressed, and land use is also addressed this way as well. We know how to do it because we've got, well, perhaps 100 years of history with trying to grow food in ways that don't involve traditional agricultural technologies. And we know what plants need, and we know what animals need. And when you combine those two groups of elements together, you get perfect diets for both. We're doing it now in various places, and here are some examples that I'm just showing you. So growing food indoors is not a big challenge, and here are some economically driven, hydroponically available plants that you can buy at your local supermarket. And that's a big list. So my suggestion is to apply indoor proven technologies of growing food in various ways under controlled conditions and turning it into tall buildings so that you can actually live in the building that uh, you're farming in at the same time. Wouldn't that be neat? Go home to your dorm room on the way up the stairs, pick your meal for the evening from the walls that surround you. No agricultural runoff from indoor farming, year-round crop production, no crops lost from severe weather events, uses 70% less water, and because it's more efficient than outdoor farming, okay, let's not farm outdoor anymore, let's farm indoors and give land back to nature. More advantages, remediates gray water, that's black water minus the solids. You can use plants to do this. In fact, John Todd, who doesn't work far from here at the University of Vermont, uh, championed uh, uh, living machines. It creates lots of new jobs. It supplies produce for people living in inner cities. It uses abandoned city properties. You don't even need to build a new building for this. And you can grow stuff inside which you don't have to eat. You can actually use it for fuel or you can actually make plants, make drugs for you and other proteins of interest that are medically relevant. One indoor acre is estimated to replace about 10 outdoor acres if it's done correctly, and in many cases it's much more than that. For instance, strawberries turns out to be 30, in 30 outdoor acres for one indoor acre. So the big reward for abandoning uh, outdoor farming is that you get it to restore back to what it used to be, and the best example of this is the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. No one has lived there since 1953. Doesn't that speak volumes to what it means to be human? Keeping humans off private property, namely the property of wildlife, means that wildlife doesn't suffer. So let's create a city that imitates nature. Let's take biomimicry principles and apply them 
using the ecosystem as the gold standard for nature. And let's create a city that has all three main groups, primary producers, primary consumers, and secondary consumers. You could, that sounds familiar to some of you, I know, because you've had courses in ecology. But cities are missing the primary producers. So I think that if you created a city like an ecosystem, it would be biodiverse, it would be balanced, it would certainly be able to repair itself. You know, I'll show you what happened after uh, Hurricane Sandy in New York. And it's sustainable as a result of that. So vertical farming becomes the centerpiece for this issue because if you grow your food within the city, that's primary productivity. And you'll see what happens to the waste products. You can create circles of reuse. And that's sustainability. And if you can do it for farming in cities, you can do it for all the other activities that occur within that city as well. So here's some examples. Here's a city environment in New York where above ground beds of soil are planted with crops of interest. And these crops are sold to the local markets and to restaurants. Now you wouldn't use the soil that's already there because it might have been impacted with industrialization and lead and automobile exhaust and things of this sort. So they're careful, you see those big packages along the side there, those are packages of, of soil that are contamination free. But that doesn't really give you a lot of productivity. Here's one in Brooklyn called Gotham Greens, run by a woman, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you another one, too. Um, that uses hydroponics as the basis for producing food year-round. And during Hurricane Sandy, they stayed open. There was another farm in Brooklyn called Brooklyn Grange, which is an outdoor farm on the rooftop of a, of a warehouse. Guess what happened to that in Hurricane Sandy? You can find it probably scattered throughout New York City. Here are where vertical farms now exist. Let me show you a few of them. There are hundreds in Japan, by the way. The one in Korea that's a demonstration project developed by the government of Korea is now being used to educate governments in the Middle East as to how to become food sovereign and food safe. It uses hydroponics as the basis for growing their food. The ones in Japan mostly use hydroponics, mostly use grow lights, but some don't. Some use traditional soil-based indoor agriculture as well. But imagine being able to go to a grocery store and with a pair of scissors, you slide open a, a cabinet, you take the scissors and you cut off what you want, put it in a plastic bag, close the door, of course, go to the checkout counter, take it home and eat it. That's about 30 minute old food. Here's one that looks more like a 747 hanger than an indoor growing system, but there it is. But here's the building I wanted to show you. Well, how would you like to work here? This is a human resource building in Japan, just built in 2010. It's called Pasona 02. And the executive that you can see in this slide is busy selecting his lunch from a different floor uh, from the floor where he works. And then he goes back down to that floor and has his lunch with his friends who went to other floors to select other things for their lunch. That's cool. That's really cool. I want to work there. <laughs> Here's one in Singapore. I had the privilege of being there about a year ago. And this operation, which is a four-story greenhouse, basically, but uses uh, traditional soil-based uh, growing conditions, it's about 2,000 square feet. That's expanded now to 10,000 square feet. And he thinks maybe they'll build a building for him in the middle of Singapore as a demonstration project in the next 10 years. Here's one in Vancouver that's about four stories tall, raises leafy green vegetables, does it by uh, using fluorescent lights, which will work, but the plants will grow slower, that's all. They're building one in Sweden. They don't have a lot of fresh produce in, this, in the wintertime, so here's the way to get it. This is a 14-story office building. The offices are in the back of the building. The south-facing facade of the building is about 20 feet out and grows leafy greens and other things, too. Uh, here's a demonstration project in Chicago. It's an NGO operation. It teaches you how to do it. It's been in there uh, for about uh, six years now, and it presumably will be there for a long time because it's a very popular visit for uh, people coming from out of town. But here's the one I wanted you to see. <laughs> this is the world's largest indoor vertical farm, and the CEO is a woman, and her name is uh, Jolanda Hartage, and she's a friend of mine. And her husband and I served on the technical advisory board for the city of Chicago for vertical farming. And he heard about the idea at this meeting and told his wife. And the next thing you know, they went out and found an abandoned um, series of uh, warehouses in the outskirts of Chicago and established the world's largest facility. She hires newly released nonviolent offenders. That's how she puts them to work. And it's worked out wonderfully. 
they're building one in Jackson, Wyoming, in case any skiers here decide to go out there for the winter. You might be able to see them building this, actually. Here's one in uh, Michigan, a uh, ready-made uh, set of growing devices. Here's one in Indiana, another one in Indiana. So there's a hotbed of competition now going on with regards to vertical farming in the Midwest. Here's one in Memphis, an all-women's outfit, okay. But who's going to work in these places? So here's a school in New York City that built a hydroponic greenhouse on their roof. And they use growing food hydroponically and growing fish aero, uh, aquaponically as a portion of their STEM program. They're going to want jobs when they get out of high school and college. I know they are. And they'll have experience. So let's start farming smart and help our planet get greener. Thanks.